On today's Prophecy in the News, we're going to take a look at Revelation chapter 20. And I've titled my article on that, Down with the Devil. Gary Stimmer is here to discuss with me a chapter with only 15 verses. Mm. 15 verses, action-packed verses, I might add. <clears throat> and they speak of something termed a thousand years. And I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key, the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Now, J.R., there is a thousand years. We've, we've talked about that thousand mm -hmm. years so many times. Yes, the millennial reign of Christ. And of course, it all begins with the devil being cast into the bottomless pit. And uh, it's interesting to me, Gary, that in this chapter, the devil is given four names. Do you remember in chapter 19, Jesus is given four names? Oh, yes. So here is the counterpart, the, the evil part. Very much so. And it, the first name that's given is dragon. And you talk about something being freighted with meaning. You know, the, the dragon, uh, uh, the, we, we think of the Oriental uh, belief in the dragon. We think of ancient European uh, mythology like St. George and the dragon. And, and we tend to relegate the dragon to mythology, but he's no myth. You know, the word dragon has a political connotation to it. Um, it represents his political aspirations to control the governments of this world. He's the power behind the thrones of all the despots. Um, he delights in cloak and dagger intrigue, in uh, pitting one politician against another, one king against another, one race against another, one religion against another, the dragon. But Gary, once he's cast into the bottomless pit, when he's let loose, you know, at the end of the millennium, mm -hmm. he is no longer called the dragon. Mm. For the dragon power, which is a political power, is no longer available to him. I think that's kind of interesting. Because, see, all of the kings and governors are all appointed by Jesus. And none of the politicians of the end of the, at the end of the millennial reign of Christ are going to be duped by the devil. Mm -hmm. because they will all be uh, born-again uh, appointees and immortal, well, the immortals will be ruling. You know, it's fascinating when we think about the dragon uh, in politics. That's really interesting because uh, the world system uh, has that kind of dragon-like, uh, in fact, we even have a word for it. It's draconian. It comes from the Greek draco, the dragon. Yes. And, and we also then, his second name is Serpent. Uh, both the dragon and the serpent are reptilian in nature. And mm -hmm. that's kind of a, a terrible uh, burden to put on somebody to call him yeah. reptilian. You know, we've, we've coined the dragon uh, uh, terminology as dragon power. Mm -hmm. I thought that was sort of original with us. I want you to know, a hundred years, over a hundred years ago, Joseph Seiss, in his book, The Apocalypse, used the term dragon power. How wow. about that? Dragon power is ended when he is incarcerated. Now, this old serpent you're talking about, mm -hmm. the term old takes us all the way back to the Garden of Eden. He is the one who beguiled Eve. That's why here, old is used along with the word serpent. And J.R., when I think of the serpent, I think of the, the accursed one. Uh, of whom the Lord said, uh, upon thy belly uh, shalt thou go, eating dust. Yeah. This is, he, he is loathsome. He's down there in the dust, and yet there's something uh, clever and deceitful about him. You know, serpent has a reference to his subtlety and his deceitfulness, his abilities to deceive. His influence upon the minds of men is notorious. Uh, not only is he able to beguile the first couple in paradise, he continues to stir rebellion among all groups, be they political or religious. Divide and conquer is the uh, modus operandi. Mm, absolutely. And again, uh, when we think of the dragon, the serpent, we're thinking of uh, the, the whole idea of reptilian uh, power. And you know, Sice also, uh, mentioned in the Gospel of the Stars, he, he mentioned Draco the dragon, you know, that yes. encompasses the, uh, uh, the, the star charts. Uh, it's amazing. That's true. And serpent the serpent. So yeah. we have both visuals in the star charts. And Joseph Seitz wrote on page 144 
444 of his book, Apocalypse, it is as the serpent that he deceives souls, insinuates false doctrine, unbelief, and presumption into the human heart, corrupts the purity of the church, and deludes men with a false and perverted wisdom. But Gary, at the end of the millennial reign of Christ, when he's loose for a little season, he is no longer called a serpent because his serpent powers are gone, and there's nobody for him to deceive. Mm -hmm. In other words, he cannot deceive the saints. So as, a, as the old dragon, he can no longer deceive uh, the political appointees of Jesus because we are the immortals who control earth. And he no longer can deceive the saints, those whose mm -hmm. eyes have been enlightened. He can only come back as the devil and Satan. So we have the four names, the dragon, the serpent, and then let's talk about the devil for a few moments, shall we? Yeah, devil uh, comes to us through the Greek, diabolos, which literally means to slander or to uh, libel somebody, tell lies about them. And, and J.R., if, if he is not the father and the perfecter of lies, I don't know who is. Yes, that's right. Our Savior talked about him in John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 44, where Jesus said he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him when he spoke when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Mm, Bingo. Yeah. And then, of course, the fourth and final name, Satan. When he comes back, he will be called the devil and Satan. Well, First Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1, talks about him as Satan. This is the first time the word Satan is used. It is a, um, a, a, a Hebrew term. Uh, tr transliterated into English. It's used over 40 times throughout the scriptures, and it refers to an adversary and an accuser. And you know, we see Satan at work by name uh, in the book of Job right at the beginning where he actually accuses uh, the righteous Job uh, before the Lord. And mm -hmm. We see him at doing his accusation work, and, and, and of course he's doing it today. That's right. Before Adam and Eve, he accused God. Mm -hmm. Before God, he accused Job. Mm -hmm. And then in uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, he is called the accuser of the brethren. Mm -hmm. So we have this Satan aspect. And so each of those four names are a particular uh, reflection of his character. He is the epitome of evil. Now, Gary, I think it's interesting that it is in opposition to the four names of the Lord given in the previous chapter. In the previous chapter, Jesus is known, for example, as the Word of God, as a, uh, one who had a name written that no man knew but he himself. That would be Yahweh. Mm -hmm. And then King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Mm. So those four names of Jesus, these four mm. names of Lucifer, isn't it amazing how John uses the... Um, the design here so magnificently. You've got to admit, from a literary standpoint, the book of Revelation is tops. Absolutely. Uh, and the uh, masterpiece of compact writing, as we mentioned at the beginning, only 15 verses describe uh, the binding of Satan for a thousand years and the reign of, of the saints. Uh, J.R., this uh, chapter starts with an angel coming down from heaven and performing an action. Yes. Uh, let's talk about that angel. You know, it, uh, most of the uh, scholars believe that this angel is none other than Jesus Christ. Mm. And it's interesting that whenever Jesus has some negative work to do, some judgmental work to do, uh, he pictures himself as another angel. It just seems to remove himself from the difficult parts. I recall when Jesus was praying in the Garden of Geth Gethsemane, Father, let this cup pass from me. I think it was referring to the fourth cup. That cup where, wherein the, um, the Jewish father at the Passover table during the ritual of the fourth cup says, Father, uh, come and avenge our blood and rid the earth of the wicked. I think this is the part that Jesus did not want to be identified with. Uh, the Lord wants to be identified with heaven, not with hell. He wants to be identified with good, not with evil. 
He wants to be known as the Lamb of God. Even when he comes back in chapter 19, verses 11 through 16, Gary, he is called the Word of God. He is called a name which no man knew, in other words, covering mm -hmm. his name. Uh, he is King of kings and Lord of lords, does not call him Lamb when he comes to judge the wicked. Mm -hmm. So I think this is another one of those cover-ups of Jesus. In other words, he is appearing in an executive form to do a specific work here. And again, we're talking about Revelation chapter 20, the binding of Satan for a thousand years. JR, we've yes. got to take a break. This is interesting. Right. When we come back, we're going to be taking a look at hell. We'll be back in just a moment. Following the battle of Armageddon, we are told that the beast and the false prophet were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. But here in chapter 20, just a few verses later, we are told that the devil is cast into the bottomless pit. Now he's going to join the beast and the false prophet a thousand years later in the lake of fire. But here he's cast into a bottomless pit. There are different chambers commonly referred to as hell. I think it would be uh, well for us to look at these various chambers of hell mm -hmm. and uh, describe them because most people just get the idea that hell is only one place. Yes, now let's begin by talking about the bottomless pit. In Greek that's abusos or it comes into English as abyss, uh, some great geological depth and then uh, the, when he is cast there uh, he is cast into perdition. You know, it's fascinating that the term perdition is uh, um, destruction. Yeah. It's uh, a, a polion. It's, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's about the ultimate term you can summon up in the Greek to absolutely smash somebody. Yeah. And that's where he is placed. Now, you know, it's where Apollos, uh, or Apollos, Apollyon came out of, this Abaddon. Right. Mm -hmm. It came out of, and he had the key to the bottomless pit, or this abyss. And he brings up all these locust-like creatures uh, to uh, swarm over the earth and uh, torment men for five months. So in other words, uh, wherever it is that he came from, the devil's going back there yes, that's right. for the thousand years. Mm -hmm. And uh, though the key is given to Apollyon to release these demonic creatures somehow, this mighty angel that comes down from heaven, which most think is the Lord Jesus Christ, retrieves the key so that he can incarcerate the uh, dragon or the uh, old serpent in this bottomless pit for a thousand years. So we have the abyss, the bottomless pit, and then we have the lake of fire. It seems to be the final place of torment. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, when we get over to the last uh, few verses of chapter 20, we read that whosoever was not, not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Mm. So this is the ultimate. But you know, there was Sheol in the Old Testament and Hades in the New Testament that were by no means considered to be the eternal abode of the damned but rather the, um, like uh, the county jail before going to the big house. Mm. Yeah, kind of an area of, uh, of uh, a temporary stop off, shall we say. Sheol, I think, was considered that way because uh, Sheol had at least one compartment where the, uh, which was deter determined, determined uh, in the Bible as Abraham's bosom. In other words, uh, that's where those who believed the promise given to Abraham uh, by faith mm -hmm. uh, were to await uh, until such time as they would be uh, then transformed or transferred to uh, the kingdom of Messiah. So uh, that was not bad at all. And yet it was Sheol, which is yes. commonly referred to as hell. According to the rabbis, according to Flavius Josephus in his dissertation on Hades, he said that it was a region um, not regularly finished, a subterraneous region wherein the light of this world does not shine, but there must be in it, he said, perpetual darkness. There was a region of darkness for the sinner, a region of light for the saints. That was called paradise or Abraham's bosom. There was a great gulf fixed between the two, but they were all considered to be Sheol or what we would term as hell. In fact, Sheol is um, translated, I think, 31 times 
uh, as um, hell and 31 times as grave and three times as the pit mm -hmm. in the Old Testament. And then, of course, the Greek term Hades is used 11 times in the New Testament uh, and translated as hell. But hell actually comes, I think, from the name of the devil himself, which in uh, Isaiah 14 was mm -hmm. uh, translated into uh, Latin as Lucifer, but originally spelled as uh, hey Yot Lamet Lamet. Yeah, his name was Helel in yeah. Hebrew, but that's very close to the and way we And then pronounce. transliterated and corrupted into the English word hell, which became uh, the general term for, uh, af after its namesake, old the devil himself. Well, J.R., there's also something called Gehenna that's translated yes. as hell, too. True. Gehenna, of course, in the New Testament, uh, and the Old Testament word for it was Tophat. I think that's, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly or not, but yeah. that's close, close I enough. guess, with my yeah. Texas accent. But uh, according to Isaiah chapter 30, verse 33, Isaiah writes, For Tophet is ordained of old, yea, for the king it is prepared. He hath made it deep and large, the pile thereof is fire and much wood. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, doth kindle it. And then in Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 31 and 32, Jeremiah writes, and they have built the high places of Tophet, which is the valley of the sons of Hinnom. So you see this Hinnom Valley became Gehenna yes. in the Greek. And uh, Jesus used that then as a metaphor term for the final lake of fire. And then there is solitary confinement, the worst part of hell, where the real master criminals are consigned, called Tartarus. Yes. And Jude, of course, refers to that. Uh, in, no, it was Peter, wasn't it? In his second epistle, mm -hmm. Second right. Peter chapter 2, verse 4, says, God has prepared the angels, uh, pre God spared not the angels his sin, but cast them down to Tartarus, translated into the King James's hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Mm -hmm. So we have these various compartments of hell. According to the rabbis, there are perhaps even more chambers of the um underworld than this. But to be sure, the lake of fire is the final abode of the uh, condemned, of the wicked, and Satan is not cast there until the end of the millennial reign. And this is a real strange thing here, that, that he's going to be incarcerated for a thousand years, but mm -hmm. then set loose f uh, to come back to the earth to foment another battle against Jerusalem and against the King of Kings. And we'll have to talk about that on our next program, but it is kind of interesting that, that he is not thrown into the lake of fire immediately. As a matter of fact, uh, it seems that the Lord can use even the evil Satan to accomplish his sovereign, his divine purpose. And he does use Satan uh, in a way uh, to bring in the kingdom, that is to say, this clash of the nations, clash of the powers that we read about Revelation 19, uh, which is fomented by Satan, is actually used of the Lord to prepare the, the conditions for bringing in the kingdom, which is a fascinating subject in itself. Indeed. So we have an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And you know, a lot of people have just thought of that as an iron chain, but it's not iron. Mm. That does not say that it is iron here. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, however, it's real. It has the ability to chain the dragon himself. He's going to be cast into hell and incarcerated there, chained for our, you know, Back in the past, um, in y y years gone by, I've considered the possibility that the devil could be simply limited to the speed of light and be cast somewhere a thousand years distance, uh, light years in distance from the earth and has to work his way back. Don't know that that's the case, but... Mm -hmm. um, it's an interesting thought. We, we know that he is going to be incarcerated, that is, he is going to be limited mm -hmm. in his ability to travel. J.R., there's, there's something else that uh, 
I feel compelled to mention, and which is that today uh, a, a large body of teaching says that hell is just a mythological idea to scare the wits out of a bunch of people so that they would become faithful followers of, of the Lord. Uh, in other words, it's a myth. But actually, and I've talked with J.R. a lot about this, uh, we believe that hell, in all of its metaphoric uh, ideas, is a real place. And that's something we need to think about. And not only is the devil going to be cast there, but the beast and the false prophet. And you know, the Bible says it is pre a place prepared for the devil and his angels. Mm -hmm. I'd hate to think that that's where I'm going to spend eternity, oh. you know? Yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, and it gives you a uh, pause for thought, uh, because uh, in the Lord there is refuge from all of this. Yes. He alone can give you eternal life. Well, we'll be back in just a moment. I'm holding a beautiful five-tape VHS video set entitled Israel, A Nation is Born. Now, this tape set was put together by Abba Eben, Israel's first ambassador to the United Nations, a gifted speaker, a great historian, uh, a man who knew every detail of Israel's foundation. And by the way, this set contains priceless historical video footage accompanied by a 60-page instructional guide so that you can uh, reference uh, what's happening point by point in each of the five tapes. You can go back and view these historical features again and again. This is a wonderful tape set. It's going to take a position of preeminence in your tape library, I'm sure. It's been offered uh, for up to $124.95 in the past. Yours for a love gift to Prophecy and News of only $100. And J.R. Church has something special for you, too. In addition to those five hours on the history of Israel, I want to include an autographed copy of our book, Hidden Prophecies in the Psalms. Now, this, of course, chronicles the history of Israel in the 20th century. Each psalm appears to be numbered according to the events that befell the Jewish people in each year of the 20th century. For example, Psalm 17 can be seen fulfilled in 1917 when General Allenby and the British Army liberated Jerusalem. The years of 1939 through 1945, the Holocaust years of World War II, can be seen in Psalms 39 through 45. The birth of Israel in Psalm 48 took place in 1948. Uh, we also even have, uh, for example, the 1991 war uh, is depicted in Psalm 91, and I've done a video called the Prophetic Psalms where we explain all of this, and we want to send this to you as well. So this will be uh, added to, as a bonus, added to this offer, and then our book will be added to the offer. Plus, I want to send you a year subscription to our magazine because every January we review the Psalms, and uh, for example, in this edition, will Psalm 100 be fulfilled in the year 2000? And every year in January, we add to this continuing study of the Psalms. This is our way of saying thank you for your $100 gift to the Ministry of Prophecy and the News. We've been here for 24 years serving the Lord and serving God's people, and keeping up with the history of Israel, and looking forward to the second coming of Israel's Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we want to offer all of this to you. It's a $180 value. The videotape on hidden prophecies in the Psalms called the Prophetic Psalms, our book, which would be autographed just for you. And then, of course, the five hours, the five tape video, Israel, a nation is born, along with a year's subscription to our magazine. Call us today, will you? And uh, make a love gift to the Lord. Help us in our ministry. If you do not subscribe to our magazine, Prophecy in the News, I want to tell you this is the November issue, 2003. And we'd like to send it to you as a free sample if you have not received a sample copy, or if you do not presently subscribe to Prophecy in the News. And this way you'll be able to look through it and see what our magazine is like, the research that we do, and perhaps you'll want to subscribe. Gary? Indeed, and uh, of course month after month we uh, go in depth, far more de depth, by the way, than we can accomplish in a 30-minute television program on prophetic subjects of all sorts. And J.R.'s article, by the way, on the 20th chapter of Revela Revelation is to be found in the magazine mm -hmm. as well. So call the phone number at the bottom of your screen and ask for a sample copy of Prophecy in the News. 
This is J.R. Church and Gary Stemmer. Until next time, keep looking. Prophecy in the News is a viewer-supported ministry sponsored by our many friends across America and in your area. For your gift of $10, you can receive a special edition of our current program on audio tape, or for a gift of $20, we'll send you our programs on videotape. For either order, call the 800 number on your screen right now. Thank you.